Welcome in today's lecture, drawn along session on world architecture and Western civilization. We're in the classical language, and we'll be using the design markers again to work through 12 through 9. And you'll have your sketch either ready to screen capture or from the PDF find the Colosseum in Rome. Colosseum's elliptical theater, as you can see here in the model form in the center of the city of Rome, in Italy, just east of the Roman Forum. It's the largest ancient amphitheater ever built and still is the largest standing amphitheater in the world despite its age. It's enormous in size. And construction began roughly in the first century between 690, 659 and 79 AD. It's all of stone and concrete and basically built by tens of thousands of Jewish slaves under the rule of Emperor Vespasian. So we're going to work from one of the axial points of entry here, which you see in the photograph. And so the horizon line is fairly easy found because we've got some human beings standing next to it. So I like this is the scale. The, the road slopes down a bit. So when this was actually taken in a photograph, it is a bit higher than that person's head. So if we draw that person in the base here, we'll see the horizon line a bit higher than that. So about well, maybe a quarter to a fifth from the bottom of the page, you'll find our horizon line. Now, because we're going to be right on this axis point, on the central arch, there's four major portals into the amphitheater itself, the Colosseum. We're going to have one point dominant in the perspective. So if this was a box, we'd be looking at sort of the front elevation of it. But it's not a box because, as you can see here, it's a very dominant elliptical buildings, so all the lines are not only going to vanish, but they're going to curve away to us. So we've seen this before in prior lectures where the arc of the curve at the horizon line is absolutely flat. When we come to the first terrace here, there's a bow in the curve here. This bow on the second terrace is even more pronounced and so on and so forth as we make way to the top. So we're going to draw it from this open access over here on this portal. So we're gonna see some of the high point over here and then some of the supports that keeps it structurally sound put in later in time because um, there were some devastating aspects in the course of its history that no longer keep the building as a whole unit. Uh, a fair percentage of it is still intact, but it still is in a deleterious state and obviously is just a museum for tourists these days, even though there are some uh, Catholic services that are offered periodically inside the amphitheater itself. So before we get too far down that road, pull out your 20% here. I'm gonna walk you through the language of the columns again, a little bit more in detail, uh, the classical order, because in this case, we're going to, instead of having the relationship being with one single person in height, we're gonna actually stack that to get a very tall building here as long as wide. And so in order to have one tall column at that point, if we rise all four stories, it would be so wide, there's no stone that could be quarried for it. So what they do instead is they break it down to smaller scale columns and then stack them. And that's how you get the change in the quality of the column from the Doric to the Ionic to the Corinthian as you grow in order. So the more celebrated columns are on top, the more structurally supportive ones, the masculine Doric order is on the base. So if you look at the Doric order, let me kind of look at it mid shaft, sort of, some, sort of from the belly button of man on. Uh, this model doesn't show the full throw of the of the uh, column beneath it, but shows from the midpoint up. If we take this and use this as a base over on this side, follow me through the base of that column, it'll rise to a certain point relative to the portion of, of the six to one ratio of the Doric order and have its two pieces of the capital there the abacus and the echinus, which throws that capital up. And as you saw in prior sketches, the point of that is that that's the carrying element that's there to support the carried. And the carried then is what happens beyond that. And that's the horizontal element or the entablature, which is broken up into two parts. On top of that then is 
the way the building ends or terminates, which is the projection of more stone above that to protect the face of the entablature. And then periodically, there are temples that will, if this is the end of it, it will throw the pediment on top of that. In this case, there's no pediment for the Parthenon, but this language of trabeation moving out here, and then the ratio between the distance between that and the next column is really predicated on the ability of what stone can do in compressive strength and what it can't do in tensile strength. So that if you spread these out too far apart from each other, the distance is too great and the stone will fail. So the, the, the beam of stone above it, the entablature only has a certain limit before it'll fail. So these are fairly close lined up along the way. And we'll see that's true here. Although we'll also do another innovation of the arch by the Romans added to the classical language. So again, to review those, there's the base, there's the shaft of the column, which we see here, the capital, which you see here, the sort of um, outward pointing element that leads to the abacus up above, the echinus and the abacus, which is splayed out to receive then the two parts of the entablature, which are the architrave down below and the frieze, which is more decorative above. Here's what we mentioned before, the triglyphs, which sort of responds back to the nature of it used to be um, wooden beams that would come across. And so it's kind of a playful look at the history of column construction. And above that, the cornice line. This particular model doesn't have a pediment on it, but sometimes you will have flat top temples as well as pedimented temples. So those are the components that are key to all classical language. The column types can shift, depends on what type of god or temple it's dedicated to. In this case, it's just going to be a very big, tall building. Scale-wise, again, a human being is probably a, maybe a sixth of the height of one of these single arches here, as we see in the skin here. And the innovation here the Romans bring to the classical language based off of Cre um, Greek culture is the arch. And so that comes back to our problem over here of spanning between two points. If it's simply as a flat aspect here, you can't have any distance beyond a certain relationship between these points of reference moving across in plan type. However, if we go back to the arch and we'll draw one up here to show its kind of language, maybe we'll draw it on the other side on the right. The way to find a perfect Roman arch is to simply come down to the base and then strike out a distance above and the distance that would make a square and then inscribe a circle in that square. So it's a nice relationship between the one and the two in terms of the man-made and the universal above us. Project up from that and do the exact same thing again. And now if you take the midpoint of that second arch, excuse me, second circle, you create the arch. So the Roman arch is hemispherical, comes down, and then retreats into a straight vertical support system for it. So now by doing that, we've now expanded the ability to have the column on either side here and the arch above create a greater distance between the columns. So it's also, it's there for the beauty of and the elegance relationship of the one and the two geometries from platonic volumes and shapes there, but also because it gives them more breadth of open space. It opens up the facades, it opens up the volume of the building by having the arch, because imagine if you did a larger arch, how much space you could have between the columns that support that. So that's a great uh, addition to the classical language in the history of Western culture. And it's employed here at the Colosseum. About 50,000 spectators, a gladiator contest. I'm sure you've seen those in some type of movie or storified version of it. Animal hunts, reenactments of famous battles, on and on and on. Even mock sea battles because they actually could flood the basin of the inside of the Colosseum and bring in flat bottom hull boats. So one of our key aspects then is going to come back in and find that horizon line, obviously to start with. And then what we're going to do is simply put up the stages of the tiers here. So it's a four storied structure. And we're only gonna see the mass of it for the first two because again, natural things, um, 
vandalism, natural disasters, earthquakes probably did the most damage in 1231. But now it's fairly stable as, you know, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So we don't see too much of the top two, but from this view, we'll see a break that will take us up to that fourth level. So what we want to do, you can see that sort of tick marks on the edge here are going to, going to have a degree of being rounded with that fissure to go on the side because we're looking at it from the, the thin end of the oblique, sorry, on this side, the thin end of the oblique side, but we'll still get that racing curve going back. And so that's going to start from this point and kind of arc up, almost flat in front of us, and then down to the other side and quickly arc down and wrap around. And since we're doing number two, you can kind of do it a couple times and sketch it in there because we'll eliminate this line later on with the value. Now we go up a whole flight of the classical language again. We're going to repeat what we do down below. So now that arc is a cousin to it, but it's much broader and more developed here. It's going to rise up to this point and then get truncated by the demise of the building over time. You see it's stepping back on this stagger approach as it fell away and so now the three parts of structure for all the seating kind of get receded in the distance so that's going to come to this point break and start up again and come over onto the other side when it comes to our vertical it's going to wrap around again so you see that as we march down the line would get flatter and flatter if there was an arc or a circle we wanted to draw on the horizon line it would simply be a flat line and then beneath it now at the base We've got almost a flat line, but it bows away in the opposite direction to show the actual base of the Colosseum. So coming from this end, it wraps around here to the base and continues over on this side and then curls around to the back side like you're doing a giant wedding cake here. And then stage three and four are more the same, but you can see the arc of the circle gets more and more broad. It comes up to this point. And then finally the fourth, it's so far away from our position of viewing this that it almost would be closer to a complete circle at that height. If it had a fifth and sixth story, we'd feel like you're under a dome almost, even though it's just the plan of a circle in two dimensions. And then we have our key aspects for the sides here. And that kind of just establishes the shape and form of this uh, place we're gonna infill. So the next step, um, uh, for this renowned, renowned symbol of Imperial Rome is to put in the series of arches, which simply create this massive aspect of having portals all the way around for easy access and easy um, dispensing of people after the events. So they said it might have been, a, uh, could accommodate 87,000 people, but probably more than 50,000 would come on a routine basis because it was free to all Romans to come to these events. So the idea for a good stadium, even to this day, is quick access and quick egress. So that's really important today because of more fire hazards. But back then, just to make it uh, not cumbersome to come to an event, there are portals all over to let people exit wherever they were in the stadium, not just a couple. There are four main portals on the axes of the um, ellipse itself. So we're going to start with the ones that are closest to us right in the center. So this is set back a bit because we only see the outside ring up to this point. Because it gets stopped and that fails. So as soon as you come to this point in our architecture, which, which is sort of supported by angular bastions of concrete to make sure this wall stabilizes over time, it comes down to the base here. And in a sense, it's unraveled the first and then eventually the second tier of skin here. So you're looking at the interior skin on this part of the building, and you're looking at the exterior skin on this half of it. It kind of looks like all the same facade here, but this you'll see that these uh, arches are further in the distance, so they won't be as tall as the one on the, on the left side. So we'll start with the ones right on the axis here, and we'll simply then make sure we're very circular and curvilinear to that aspect. And now what's gonna happen is we get off of our one point, you can see the one point dominates with the walkway up to it. If we move off to the right, the vertical lines, because we're so close to a tall building, actually vanish. 
to a point that's not on the horizon line. And this is what we talked about briefly. Sometimes in other sketches on a very tall aspect is the two dominate left and right. If you're centralized, it becomes a one point perspective. But if it's a tall building, you actually want to use the third point up here. And that allows the verticals to be trained to a point. So instead of having all these supporting columns for the arches go straight vertically, which you could do, but that would push you much further back from the building. Once you get closer to it, this point comes in so that the edge of the Coliseum here and the edge of the Coliseum there all goes up to a point, probably two feet off the page. And yet you still have to honor that because we're so close to the building. So anytime you do a tower or something that's significantly vertical compared to your frame of reference, you want to introduce that point. In this case, it's on the same line as our one vanishing point down there. So that's rare because we don't do too many tower sketches because uh, most architecture is horizontal or smaller relative to the human perspective. But in this case, it's appropriate. So if you work on the right side, then we'll simply come along and give space for the pier that supports the column and then its arch, the pier that supports its column and then the arch, the pier and the column and the arch. Kind of march that along there, re realizing at the top of all these arches are also kind of contained in the arc of a circle that's coming back and wrapping around. So the heights of these are the same in real life, but the diminishing in the, the perspective we're doing here on the paper. And when you come to the end, it becomes very tight because they're wrapping around the sides and not only get smaller, but there's two or three that wrap around the corner and we only see the aspect of a couple towards the end. So they splay out and become individualized. They come over here and do the opposite coming the other way, but we're seeing more of an arch closer to us because this skin is closer to us. So that'll come down. And then at this point, you see these verticals. I've got the tick marks in there for you. So you make sure we're going to vanish back around the corner here. And again, we'll see many, many more arches in the same amount of distance as that wraps around that corner because they're equal, equally spaced, but not physically going to be equal spaced on the sketch itself. So that's a good start for us there. Now, because we know it is very ordered in terms of its movement from the bottom to the top, we just continue the lines we drew of the column lines and take them right up to the fourth skin up there. So those column lines are going to be right in that pier that marches along the sides over here. And of course, there's a series up there. And because this is really are going to be our subject kind of center left here. Once we establish the quality of the detail of the several arches here, we don't have to draw that here and be very specific photographically. We're just going to kind of sketch the idea of the ribbon kind of wrapping around the building. And then that falls up into an, uh, the, the top tier, which is really more of a, a wall that held the celebrated canopy, which would shade the people. And it's got some punched openings into it. So now I'm going to go to the second deck and find those arches with the piers involved up there as they wrap around. Again, the tops of those are going to curl around to this one side. And then finding the third tier. And so the edges of all the arches going up are parallel and all marching back toward that vanishing point up to the top. But that's enough now to kind of finish number two on this side. We'll come over on the right now and do the same thing. This one's got a large opening above it. And then it's next one moves over here on top of that. This one comes up. This one comes up. And now we're at a point where, because of um, this information on the skin, we don't see through here. It's another wall that supports the seating level that used to be not visible from the outside and now is. So right now it's a bit more of just punched openings in it. And yet some of the verticals of the column line from below 
continue up to that level. And then right about this point, the enclosure that was added in, one more arch behind that wall, we see from skin number two. So we see the outside skin is three, the inside skin that, that was the interstitial that supported the stands on the inside, then find the skin of the wall from the third level that's in the interior. That comes to this point and then drops down to about there. Okay, so the last thing we're going to do uh, on the arches themselves for now is we're going to jump to a number three because as you can see in the photograph, once you look beyond the actual face of the arch itself, you're looking inside space, the interior. So there's an underside of the thickness of the wall on the opposite side of every arch, which is darker than the front face of the arch. So each one of these arches we see has the secondary arch that shows the actual opening. So that's going to be dark to there. And that'll give it some depth to show that the outside skin is lit differently than what's being received on the inside. And we're so close to it, we see the underside of the thickness of the wall at the top moving around. The same is true down here. It's a little bit less because we're on the ground with this arch, but we still see the underside. And then the side that's exposed to our view shed, the left side of the arch, you see that wall that people penetrate on their way into the Coliseum seating. And this is really important because that's our access to the actual field of view. We're right at axis, so it's centralized. So we're going to see both sides dark and dim on our way in. Maybe a little bit thicker there. And now we reverse it. And now we're going to do the right side top and the right side of all the arches coming down. And we'll kind of wrap around this side. And the same thing up top happens. So the underside of the arch, underside and down. We're sliding down. And since we're underneath it, we see the same amount of depth, but because we're further below, we'll see more of it, which makes the same arch seem higher up, not only on the page, but deeper into the building because we're closer to it. Same is true with this one over here. It's all dark until you see the ribbon of light that lets you into the arena behind it. And that'll be an important light, light to us because we're not going into a true interior, we're going into something that's open air. So that when we look through the actual architecture, it'll be brilliant light. And so you wanna contrast that with the stone and concrete work on the outside. No more arches up here, just some of the underside of the punched windows up top that march along that side. And same is true up there, the little tiny ribbon openings. And then finally, at the cornice line for the building, there's a dark up to that point. So the way it's worked out now is for the purpose of events and having people there inside and the tours and stuff, the lower level, you're under the shroud of all the seating. There are some little bits of penetrating light for access points. We have to be on that access to see that. So by and large, what we can do real easy is flip over to the chisel side of the three and now simply cloak the inside of the arches as a dark area because they're not receiving nearly the light that the outside skin is, except for this one, because we see through to the open air. And then it closes up again here. And that starts us with our value chain as we move across the skin. Take it upstairs as well. By using the chisel, it kind of gets the work done a little bit quicker for us. And now up here, it's the, the lower levels are under the seating. The top two are the back of the top tier. So light is going to pervade more easily. So we're simply going to edge that arch because we see through to bright yellow stone or the sky itself in the first two, and then bright yellow stone on those. 
So it's a different type of aspect than those because this is an enclosed space once you come in. So now we're going to repeat over on this side and drop those darks down on the edge of those. And then drop some more dark here a little bit. And we'll keep kind of adding different types of darks along the way as we step up to nine. Okay, just as a reference to kind of uh, place the sky within the system here, we'll use drop back to two and simply draw some type of aspect of cloud cover to work against the brilliance of this or the, the tone of this against the backdrop. So we'll, again, the, they don't have to regulate relative to our horizon line there, just sort of nebulous forms up here so we can kind of shape our overall goals of coming down from one side and going off in the distance and then have different levels kind of dissipate in the distance going back. So we make sure our skies are always horizontal. Don't overtone them out so that they're uh, vertical to you. And then simply take that broad edge of the number two and just wash in a tone for the three zones here. All in this edge. We're going to do the same thing with the one under it, and we'll treat them differently a little bit later on as we push our value around. Then, maybe to eliminate our temple top over here, we'll simply come down to a vegetated top over here of great sort of Roman hues that are kind of vertically skyrocket junipers in a sense, okay, from the sky. And then we'll keep the, the sky right down to them as well. Same on the other side, that'll come through. Maybe we'll see a bit of a hill in the background. So that'll be a darker value at the base coming all the way down to our horizon line, which will wash out that little detail we sketched earlier. And then probably for the foreground, just to give our, our component parts here is you want to make this the walk to it of stone probably a little more brilliant than the esplanade or the grass around it and we'll take care that right around the edge of it there's a ribbon road for a little bit of car travel and all the pedestrian travel obviously over the years it gives us kind of a circular path around it and then after that it's the grass lawn and so I'll have a different value and give us a little bit of a foreground of something that this comes down to the ground and then comes out horizontally towards us. And it's a good place for, for now. So again, the whole two and three percentage um, ink markers now are going to disappear when we come through six through nine. But we'll simply step up now with our ideas of what we want to hold on to. So four is next. And we can come from more of a sun determinant. And we can probably say then we probably don't want it axial because that'll make it too or already axial as it is. So let's make this the brighter side. So keep kind of this zone a little bit brighter and whiter. And then we'll that will trail off and make this side a little bit darker. So we're going to come over on this edge and wash that kind of tier by tier with four from the edge. Remember what we completed to date. And we might want to leave it then kind of sky white here for now. So it has a nice contrast to the backdrop there. Come over here and make that. Don't worry about leaving some white in that area for now. Roll that across. And now by doing this, by having this zone of kind of moving tone across it, it's going to help the perspective. Perspective does so much with line work to get you a certain point. But now the value is going to pull that volume out towards us so that ellipse now was flat before. It's going to come off the page as we go four to nine. Uh, and then if this is the hot spot for it here, it's curving away. So we're going to start on this side and have it become darker and darker toward the right as well. Though sometimes as you physically see it, you won't be able to see these, these differentiations but you're seeing a three-dimensional space, so it works really well. You know, your eyes are, are perfect sketches, so to speak. When you're on a piece of paper, though, you have to do more technique things to get the volume to come off the page. So that'll hold for four for us for a while. Now we'll go on five. 
And now let's look at some of the architecture, which we'll detail because every time we come, we'll sort of adorn one here, like we talked about the trabiation and the architectural language of how these are set up, because this is a defined language. This is like a recipe for cooking. This is the recipe for architecture that's been passed down for over 2000 years now. There still are neoclassical architects building today around the world. So we're going to come up to the component parts here and know that right above the arch, there's a little bit of a gap. There's a little bit of a keystone each one will have. And the keystone is the final decorative stone, which kind of celebrates the, the actual physical point where structure is, is um, the physics of it is passed along to the lower levels. So the architecture of the arch comes down to this point and the arch drives it down either side. So that's why that's celebrated up there. Then there's a little bit of a gap of space and then that starts its system of line work that has the idea of it being an entablature on top of that that's going to wrap around. And that for us creates a bit of a shadow line wrapping around our original number two line here. So there's a shadow at the base and there's a shadow up top and then decoration above that. So you'll have every time there's a column beneath it, We'll go and put a stronger shadow side now on the column edge. The column comes up and has, at this point, a very simple Doric finish to it, like this, where it's just got a little expansion to reach the abacus, which then spreads the load, accepts it, and drives it down triangular to the midpoint of the line here. And so we want to have a little bit of detail here, and on this point for the one on this edge, which comes down, and then it supports. Every time there's a column, there's a break in the entablature moving along. So we'll highlight that. And then as we move away from us, we don't have to detail the columns as much. We're going to detail the ones with different value more and more right in this kind of central third for us. So take that up to the top then, right above the center of each arch. Again, that little keystone. And that gives you the point of reference to draw in the entablature for that floor line. And then finally the top here, that underside will be darker sort of cast with shadow. And then it's a little bit more delineated with line work wrapping around. Detail for that wall. So we'll move that across the skin now. We've got columns raising up. Temperature level here on the second tier. Now some of this will be just contemporary sort of bastions to hold up what's remaining from the actual site itself. So some might be true and, and some less. And then right about here, it starts again where the piers are rising up. Sometimes the columns are non-existent at certain levels because when it came to medieval times, sometimes the classical language buildings became really just quarries for more contemporary work. But we'll draw it as if the columns still wrap around. And then that comes up point, and then the architrave. And then these columns come down, but there's also a little ribbon of a rail detail that wraps around. So when people come um, in between events or they're meandering the halls outside the seat underneath, there is that three foot barrier for security that lines around that second floor. And then we'll see it again a little bit at the third floor here as people rise up to the top of the seats. That's an extra line that the top floor, uh, floor won't have up here. And um, this line is fairly non-distinct now, probably from vagrancy over the years, but we'll kind of put it back in just to give us that extra ability to wrap that around. Um, some of the, the brick itself, when you see the brick exposed, that means the stone skin or, or elements like that have been taken away for other purposes and years of decline. And now we'll come to our edges again, and now we'll use the, 
the uh, 50 percent here is the weight again to cordon off where we're going to go with uh, six seven eight nine and so again we'll go right to our inside spaces which are darker so let's start in the center and realize that's going to want to go a little bit darker here and then trail down the sides of both to get up and under there the same thing happens here but to a lesser degree because it's only on the first floor and then move to the right if you like and you'll see a bit more of the darkness on the right each one and then some might be complete blanketing of the darkness and it marches along to the right here by the time you get to the edge of it you're seeing the same amount of architecture but it's so compressed from this point of view it ends up being kind of a diagram for it as it makes its way around that turn drop it down to this point again and do it again you'll see more of this side of the space inside. And then finally up top, the top and the right side is receiving less light. Good time to put in the, the vegetation back here, the sort of version of these skyrocket junipers that are the favorite back in the Roman day. And at the base, maybe smaller horizontal elements adjacent to them. So we'll start with those just with a wash to give them their base tone. And we're going to run it right up to the edge of the building as a break. Then it's always nice to show those coming down with their support, their structure, it takes it down to grade. And that's our break line to bring our base green area up and around. And because we don't want to make that too uh, regular a tone, we'll start where we need it most next to our walkway with number five, and then move to the blunt end and simply again do pressure at one side and just pull away from it. And that way you can dissipate it pretty quickly that way. Start here and pull away. That's a little bit further in distance to background, some more monolithic. If you show less interest in your drawing the detail, that tells the reader it's less important. If you're actually talking to the person who's looking at your artwork by what information you provide. And now six more of the same, just return. And follow your way along the skin of the building and see where perception of more dark areas can be found. So and again, it's always the underside when the sun's coming down or coming from this side, it's bouncing and trying to push light back up. So the underside of the arch will always see the least amount of light as you make your way back to those. And as we get to seven, eight, and nine, we'll actually go back depths in the spaces too. And you might ask, why not just jump right to the the 90 percent do it right now if you layer these more it's going to bring more life to the sketch because you're never going to do the same strokes twice you're going to sort of integrate a variety of ways of looking at light shade and shadow playing together you'll probably find over the course of 
pen design marker sketch essays like this, you'll be using one or two more than the rest of the nine, and they're going to probably wear out and you'll lose your ink and density. You have to replace those sooner than the others. I'm going to sign all of our projecting entablatures. Mark those up. We have the base of all the trees. And with the 60 now in the lower third. And you might even tell in this sketch that this particular six that I pulled out of my little uh, jar of six is weaker than some of the others, which makes it kind of ideal. It makes it kind of like a five and a half or Sometimes you get a wet seven, it's closer to an eight. So they all tend to merge and become each other. As the five dries out, it actually becomes a four. So they all blend and you want to kind of always layer over them if you can. We'll turn the corner here because the little pieces that wrap around to end the structure when they kind of reinvigorated it by these uh, diagonal supports, have got a little profile, which is kind of nice at those points there. And then to separate the skins there, we could probably make the second level fall back a bit away from the front by giving it a different tone. And you want that tone there anyway because it's gonna harbor the light through back to the sky here. I'll make that edge a little bit sharper. And now up to seven. Now we're looking for the final continuity of how the building reads with line first and detail information. And then we'll use eight and nine to pull out the final dark value. So our goal again with line work is if the architecture is holding space behind it, that's a very important line. Or if it's just a surface piece here and there's no value structure, that can remain as is. So we're going to come over to the precipice here and work that seven nice and fine to that edge. And here's the profile we talked about before based off of the human visage of how nature has given us a way to kind of create a profile of architecture on our heads. And so the same is true for the architecture. Differentiate the planes here at the corners more so than the mid body. You should have those edges going around that backside and then these angular lines, which are gonna give you support using that triangulation to help it for the future years now. And now uh, a key line now is the underside of a value done so far to show now you're actually inside the arch when you pass that line. And drive that back. You can see the, the space of the dark is getting smaller and smaller as you move back that way. Here is very important because you're walking out into the bright sunlight after you go through the underpinnings of all the seating inside. Things true over here. Drop that down. And so you can see a little bit of vibrancy as we get to seven, eight, and nine as it starts to pull the darker closer to us because that intrigues the eye most. And now that inverts itself and comes over the other side, we see the edges of the openings. And then we see the interior edge and the darkness up above. So the arena itself on the inside uh, was about 275 feet by 160 feet. And uh, it seems like if you walk in, you'd expect sort of a just a dirt basin. And that's what shows, but it actually has several tiered arrangement of stratified nature beneath it. 
that allowed all this stuff to come up from 80 different doorways and access points and a subterranean network of tunnels and cages beneath where things popped up and created the show from the inside. So it's actually a deeper building than it looks, and it's got more of a, a ability to create an arena for all these rhinoceroses and hippos, elephants, giraffes, lions, panthers, tigers, crocodiles, even ostriches. They bring in the world to show the conquest of Rome in terms of what they've acquired over the years. And so the seven is going to go in the same places as the six, only in less of the areas. You should sort of heighten the awareness closer to the subject and make sure there's a cash shadow beneath that. Maybe at the rim of the grass to show it's got its three or four inches above the actual pavement itself. That'll help out. Probably give our individual person a bit of a cast shadow, one side to a person. And then a key shadow here will be, we'll see from our viewpoint up front into the space and out, but the in, inside of the space is actually a dark area because the Coliseum itself is casting a shadow on it. So we want to arc something sort of angular a bit from here to here. And that's a nice dark that'll set that interstitial space down for us. To kind of move us through that tunnel into that space. And then those sequences of arches that come down from below include a nice dark aspect of the interior closer to us. It wraps around on this side, the same thing. You see that back arch line for that one. This edge all the way around the top of it. Typical of most sketches, you want to make sure the terminus of your information has a nice strong line to it. it. Doesn't have to be the full black like a 90, but it can certainly be the 70 range. And then you wash your value up to it so the line disappears. The line here is going to hold because it's got the space. This one's going to be held by the trees themselves, which makes the line go the way. Because again, the line doesn't really exist there. It's just plain and tone against plain and tone. Okay, and on to 80. Now I want the, the highlights of the highlights. Where do you want to put your final dark areas in here? So again, it's time to squint down. If you squint at the screen now, it seems to me like the whole skin of it kind of comes out to be the same type of gray. So before I drop in more of the dark areas, I'm going to come back to number four and make that zone of this turning away from us and being opposite the sun angle itself a little bit stronger. So washing this side more at this edge should be able to wrap that around more. So even though there was a 20 or 30 laid on it, it almost ends up looking page white at this stage once you add the other values to it. So it looked to me as I squinted down on it, that's important to bring this extra zone of value down there. And even this kind of streakiness kind of lends to its unclean, unkempt, 2,000 years age to it as it's a really, not decrepit, but certainly a tax building over time. And I can go back to the 80 and try to go into wherever I've done a dark now and just add a bit more of the language of dark in dark so that at the top, and the right of each area up here is the darkest part that I can read. Maybe a little bit coming down in that one too and wrap it around the corner here. Not everywhere and certainly not more than a minute's worth of articulation here. We'll 
bring that interest level of darks within darks. And you'd want to chase too many over to this side because you're going to lose any ability to see into the space. But certainly in front of us here, there could be more generation of that type of dark. And again, as soon as we move, uh, move away from the middle third, we stop using the 80 and the 90. So I'll take that 40% again and come over to the right side in this edge and make it a little bit stronger against the sky. Maybe pull a little bit more value into the line work of the tablature here. And for the columns that are closer to us, articulate those a little bit more as they make their way up. And now finally for 90. And this is our last 30 seconds of the final now deep dark black. And the key edge is probably just in the middle third of the drawing. Maybe the far edge of that one, a little bit of the interior you can see. And to pull this column off of the back there, so we see that in the front, and we maybe drop 40% on the architecture right beyond it, so it recedes a bit. Because we want to push this secondary zone beyond that, and the secondary zone ends about here. So we can push that zone. Beyond that. So it's ringed by a total of 80 entrances. And uh, it's history moving forward. In the Middle Ages, it or medieval architecture, which you've looked at to date, the Pope eventually relocated to Avignon away from Rome. So it caused a really big population uh, decline in Rome and left the region insecure. So at that point, around 13th, 1300s, 14th century, the Colosseum was largely abandoned. And so it really became a quarry or a popular den for bandits. So it went in a massive decline and, and then eventually sort of the, as Italy itself matured, it realized that it had to stabilize the the importance of this in the history of the language of the Italian state. So that's what brought it back. And today it's fairly well salvaged and protected. One more a little bit against here. And now we'll come back to our 20% for the sky. And then just push that just basically at the bottom of what we did before so that some of the clouds in the sky are a little bit more bulbous and have a darker edge next to a brighter point and do the same thing again down here where they're softer and they strike something against the building 
and then carry that through over here a bit so we have a nice gray against the white. And keep pulling it over to the base over here as well. And perhaps to uh, show that clouds that might be directly above us are actually having a play on the lower plane down here, they can throw light and shadow on sort of disorganized, non-perspectival views that relate to our building, but still play by similar rules or they'll, they'll do a pattern of moving across the wind pattern here. So down here, you might have then cutting across here a zone of a cast shadow from clouds onto the lower level, and then take the same thing and do it a little bit further distance to show there's another pattern further down the walkway. And adjacent to that, another one down that walkway and cuts across the grass. So then if you take your whole, whole flat plane and then cut it horizontally as well, so it doesn't read vertically, that helps to sit that down. There's a technique that even though it's only an inch or two on your page, if you pay attention to it, it really then gives more capacity to the earth to hold this much weight and stone beneath it. Well, you might have a little bit, if you go to a number four here, if we come over just to the base of Coliseum over here, actually I'll use a five, I'm gonna go dark as a five here, is that throw of light now, if it's coming from this side, from this side over, it'll actually cast a bit of a shadow that's going to follow kind of a little bit of an arc, a projection back on this side. And so we won't see so much of a white. We'll see that darkened path and darkened green space on the other side. And that might help sit it down more by showing it's actually got that possibility of anchoring it to the ground plane. So again, that's a quarter inch of work, but helps the perspective of sketch kind of move and celebrate the value you've been working with for the last hour. So now with those two pieces of classical language, it gives you some more information on that period. And then with the birth of Christianity and Constantine adopting in around 350 AD, that as the Christian faith, the dominant faith in the Roman Empire, there's a demise and decline of the empire completely. And so we're going to address that by moving into the architecture of the Middle Ages in our next two draw along sessions. And so if we were to come closer to it, I would simply just bring it closer to the lens. As we bring it closer to the lens, it'll tend to start to uh, tilt the verticals towards a point up above the screen. And so that's what we sort of intended to do with the sketch here now. So from this distance, it sort of flattens out more. And it's less uh, impressive in a sense because the further away you go, you let, use the sense of scale. So as you march closer to architecture, sometimes it's an advantage to use that point in the sky.